and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. Welcome to The Future is Female. This is the show where we find the extraordinary in every woman. Now, to commemorate International Women's Day, today's episode aims to shine a spotlight on the pressing issue at the intersection of gender equality and health, the gender pain gap. So someone who is passionate about working towards closing this gap is my guest tonight, Dr. Hannah Nazri, who is the director and founder of the collective Malaysian Doctors for Women and Children. She's also a National Institute for Health and Care Research Academic Clinical Fellow in Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Warwick in the UK. She's just completed her PhD in Endometriosis Research at Oxford University. Welcome to the show, uh, Dr. Nazri. It's good of you to join me. I appreciate your time. Um, I'm hoping we could start our conversation today maybe by you telling, telling us a little bit about, about yourself and about your, your journey. How did you end up advocating for women's health through the work that you do? Um, hi everyone, I'm Hannah Nazri. Um, thank you, Melissa, for a very lovely introduction for myself. I, I did my medical degree at the University of Bristol and I sort of like became interested in obstetrics and gynecology and as I learned more about women's health I realized how underfunded this area is so many gynecological conditions like endometriosis we still don't have a cure we still don't have the best way to diagnose it and lots of women have to go for surgery to have it diagnosed although there's a new guidelines on that but I wouldn't uh, tell you much about that um, Basically, I started the Malaysian Doctors for Women and Children because I do feel there's a huge gap between what we understand about women's biology and how we treat women. And this is reflected in our attitudes on how we treat women in pain and uh, how uh, our practice of female circumcision. Right, okay, so I want to cover all of that in our conversation today. It's quite ambitious to want to cover so many topics, but um, talk to me about the gender pain gap and how it manifests in the healthcare, uh, in healthcare settings, because I think a lot of us maybe know the concept, have heard of the concept, but don't understand how it uh, manifests. So uh, gender pain gap is the disparity in option and management between men and women. And while we know that while well, research actually shows that men and women experience pain a bit different with the biology or uh, factors, we do have evidence that women have increased pain sensitivity and therefore women feel pain at a lot lower threshold and this is not always acknowledged. Women also suffer from a lot of chronic pain conditions like endometriosis and because of the normalization of period pains, trivialization of men's uh, women's pain um, this is very much underdiagnosed of course there's other factors why endometriosis is not diagnosed much earlier and women who suffer from endometriosis for example take uh, six to twelve years uh, to be diagnosed and in the meantime you have a lot of pain and a lot of uh, lack of understanding from other people yeah. within the medical practice there are studies to show that women when they go to the emergency department with abdominal pain they're given less pain relief and they have to wait longer than men uh, for pain relief and that's a study by China Tell. and there's another study to show that women are given more sedatives compared to pain relief uh, post cardiac surgery and I find that incredible why because we think we think that women are hysterical and emotional so we don't believe them it's awful <laughs> okay so so when you say we are you referring to society or are you referring to medical practitioners I, I'm referring to everyone so okay. it's pandemic the doctors healthcare professionals your family your husband might not believe that you're in pain so it, it is a big problem for women Okay, can we talk about the role of doctors? Because um, I'm curious to know how doctors, uh, how maybe stere social stereotypes or gender biases that they may hold influence um, healthcare providers' perceptions of um, women's pain and their response to it. Are there gaps in maybe medical training or medical education that um, allow for or, or perpetuate the gender pain gap to, ha to happen, to keep happening? Well, um, I will talk about uh, this in two separate ways. So there's um, the pain management mm. aspect of it. And of course, there's the uh, social aspect of it. 
uh, pain management, pain education worldwide. I mean, I'm not an expert in managing pain specifically. That's the domain of the anesthetist and the pain specialist. But I do know that it is a bit underwhelming. It could be better. That's the global expert opinion. Um, but going back to how we treat women in pain, um, at this very moment, there's no objective measures of measuring pain. So we have to rely on what patients tell us. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I believe healthcare professionals need to examine their own biases when they treat women, and they need to be aware of the studies surrounding gender pain gap. All right. So if it's um, contingent on what patients tell doctors of their levels of pain, are there um, cultural norms or expectations around gender that affect uh, individuals' willingness to seek help for pain-related issues to admit that they are um, suffering from pain? Well, uh, the, the standard thing that women do is like women don't tell anyone when they're in pain because no one believes them. <laughs> that, that That's the truth. And But I also want to say that we should be aware of our own bodies and we should be more tuned with our own menstrual cycle. I mean, we always hear this buzzword, financial literacy, mm -hmm. but what about health literacy? What about health literacy? I mean, health is wealth. Shouldn't we encourage health literacy as well? And um, aside from asking women to advocate for themselves, surely, like, of course, a healthcare professionals should meet in the middle and listen and believe women so that we empower them to seek help when they need it. All right, can I, can I ask you then, are um, there specific policies or reforms that you believe are necessary to, um, to ensure that there is equitable pain management for all genders? Um, but also, I, I wonder, specifically for the field of endometriosis, um, is there anything that re needs to change or needs to improve within this field? Okay, that, that's quite a big question. So. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let me try and answer them. So, okay, um, I've been following the discourse surrounding menstrual relief, and lots of people have lots of opinion about it. And one of the interesting opinions that I've heard is that if we give menstrual relief to people, we are uh, discriminating women because that's th that is an admission of weakness. Mm. And also there's this idea that, oh, if we have menstrual leave, then people will take leave as they wish, uh, people will play truancy, blah, 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 blah. But let me ask you back, I mean, is it all right for women to suffer in pain? No, it's not. And we know like how underdiagnosed endometriosis is, how women don't feel empowered to speak about their own pain. So actually by allowing menstrual leave empowers these women who are afraid or don't feel um, encouraged to tell their empl employers that I, I, I think I'll need menstrual relief because I have terrible period pains. Talking about periods is a taboo in our society. Mm -hmm. So like not many girls or women are happy to talk about period pains. And there's actually a study uh, by Wong in 2011, uh, which look at Klantani's girls who suffer from a severe pains. Uh, one reasons is because all and they don't feel ready to talk about it. There's a lot of taboo around it. Um, another thing that I would like to bring a, bring across, uh, um, granting emergency leave for everyone dismisses the unique perspectives that women experience monthly. Mm. And that is akin to I don't see any, I don't see colour, in my opinion. Right, so so it's not it's not a level playing field uh, within the field of endometriosis because you've completed your your PhD in this this field. Are there what would you say, um, Dr. Nasri, are the pressing priorities for researchers, for healthcare providers, for public health policymakers, even to consider around um, the issue of of endometriosis and, and menstrual health? I think the issue would be the issue of funding. So women's health is grossly underfunded. We still don't understand why endometriosis happens. Uh, we still don't have the best way to diagnose endometriosis and we don't have a cure for endometriosis. There is this myth that after you have surgery for endometriosis, it'll just go away, that's a cure, but that's not true. Recurrence do happen and women still suffer so, after surgery. So, so we don't know why endometriosis happens and we don't have a cure for it is that is that is that what you're saying yes that's what i'm saying okay how how far away are we from advances in this field 
uh, pretty far away, I'm afraid. And a lot of the endometriosis research happens in Northern Europe, and we don't have enough data uh, in Asia. There are some uh, research uh, groups in China and Taiwan and possibly Singapore, but I feel that we need to be in line with the World Endometriosis Society so that we can actually compare notes and uh, make advances in this, uh, in this area. I'm speaking to Dr. Hannah Nasri and I'm going to take a very quick break here on The Futures Female. We'll be right back after these messages. Stay tuned. Welcome back to The Future is Female. I'm Melissa Idris. We, on this episode, we are commemorating International Women's Day and we were, we're talking about a pressing issue at the intersection of gender equality and health, which is the gender pain gap. I'm speaking to Dr. Hannah Nazri, who is director and founder of the Collective Malaysian Doctors for Women and Children and also National Institute for Health and Care Research academic clinical fellow in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Warwick in the UK. She's also a member of the Board of Advisors for the Asia Network to End Female Genital Mutilation and Cutting. Um, Dr. Nazri, I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, FGMC, or in Malaysia, more commonly known as female circumcision or, or cutting. I, I'm wondering why this is a cause that you... Are, are so passionate about? Why is this a practice that you are keen to see end? Well, uh, coming from a community which practices female circumcision, which internationally falls under female genital mutilation cutting, um, of, of course I would be interested in it. And mm. also with the glaring eyes of the international community, as more attention is given to Asia. However, the world doesn't quite understand what's what the practice is in Malaysia or Asia and derived a lot of the assumptions from the African practice. And I right. feel this is not helpful in ending the practice. We need to understand what happens locally and be led by local stakeholders, people who uh, experience it to, to stop the practice rather than de deriving the practice from uh, Africa. And that's why I, I'm passionate in this uh, area. You're absolutely right. This is almost always framed as an African issue. So, so what is it that we need to understand about the practice of FGC here in this region and particularly in Malaysia? So uh, in Malaysia, we have types four and types one female genital cutting and type one, uh, without going too much into the anatomy, uh, is the more invasive one. Mm. Um, and there's a study by Rashid Patel in 2020, which but how varied this practice is. And you can look at the verba time transcripts of these doctors who perform female genital cutting and you will understand like not many quite understand what they're doing, unfortunately. And uh, there's um, an overriding uh, view of not understanding the uh, clitoral anatomy. And a fraction of these doctors tend to cut a bit more. And that's a worrying uh, trend. I wouldn't say much, except like if you could read the leaflet I've written uh, with Arrow, you'll understand it a bit more, what I'm trying to say. Yes, um, I think it's worth worth seeking out this information. I think for many of us, we may have heard of it, but we don't fully understand the uh, anatomy of the different the four different types of uh, female genital mutilation or cutting. Um, most, most of the times when we talk about it, there's often a, a religious um, element of it. Uh, but as I understand it, it's not an Islamic imperative and that there are no clear verses in the Quran that supports it. When we think about the drivers of um, female genital cutting, how do you uh, address that in your advocacy work, Dr. Nazri? So uh, the Malaysian doctors who are women and children, we try to educate healthcare professionals and I always try to stick to my lane. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't want to comment too much about the religious perspective in, and if I do, I would ask religious experts. And of course, uh, a lot of people will go back to the fatwa, to the religious council, what are their views about it? But you have to understand these fatwas are also derived from the views of medical experts. Mm. And, and, and of course, medical uh, experts, healthcare professionals would defer to the fatwa. So it's not quite uh, <laughs> uh, uh, 
one direction kind of like a conclusion is they always defer to each other. So as a medical expert, in view of what I found and in view of detailed clitoral anatomy, in which if you were to perform female circumcision safely, you would need microsurgical tools, then probably we shouldn't do it. Right. Let, let's talk about that because the medicalization of um, FGC or the medical practice of this by, pro, um, by healthcare professionals, it has lent a legitimacy to the practice. H how do we get the healthcare community to play a role in um, ending this practice, in uh, educating not just themselves and the medical community, but also patients and people who ask for the procedure to be done on their children, on their daughters. Yeah, so uh, I think going back to uh, medical education and it has to be uh, from university and we have to keep re-educating re um, healthcare professionals about it. I'm not saying that uh, they're not, not aware of it, but they're probably uh, not too aware of it. If you probably have learned it in medical school, probably have forgotten it a bit because you've gone into a different area of specialization. So I would like to bring back um, a bit of the clitoral anatomy back to you so that you understand a bit more. So I think overall, uh, we need to have a better understanding of the anatomy, its potential harm. And then, uh, of course, um, our, our role at Malaysian uh, Doctors for Women and Children is not mainly to edu educate the public, but we hope to produce some patient information leaflets so that you can read about it as well. Okay, can I can I ask you, there's, al there's also this narrative that says, well, actually, uh, performing this procedure in a clinical setting, in a medical setting with, uh, you know, medical tools and the credentials of a healthcare professional, that all um, actually will reduce any potential harm or complications that can come from traditional practitioners uh, doing the procedure. How do you respond to that, that narrative that actually there's a harm reduction conversation happening here? Right. So, um, of course, um, I don't know if the audience know about this, but it's probably if you've probably read around, there is a study in 1999 which looked at the long term implications of female circumcision. And a lot of women reported that we have no problems and like no obstetric complications, blah, blah, blah. However, we have to remember that back then uh, it's done by traditional midwives and the women who were interviewed and were examined, um, they had it done as an infant. So they will have to rely on what your moms tell them. So um, it probably isn't as accurate. Also today, doctors do more of the procedure and as shown in uh, the paper by Rashid Atal, more doctors are cutting a bit more. Okay, so um, what role does the healthcare community play in ending this practice? What would you like them to know? So what uh, what I want you to know is like, number one, if you want to, if, if, this is a huge if, if we were to perform this safely, you need microsurgical tools. Mm -hmm. And this is not available in any GP surgery that I'm aware of in Malaysia. So it is not done safely anyway. But why, why, why do a practice which does not have any medical benefit? It is not taught in any medical school worldwide. It is not a medical procedure. It's a pseudo-religious practice, which we know that is not justified in Islam. And I'm not a religious expert, but I have deferred to religious expert. Mm -hmm. And But we also know religious experts also defer to medical experts. And as a medical expert, I would like to employ to stop it. But just to make everyone uh, aware as well, the Malaysian authorities, the Malaysian Medical Council are aware of this and they're working ways on how to end this practice by consulting with various stakeholders, by consulting with medical experts themselves and also with uh, civil society organisations. So we're not actually like closing our eyes and like ignoring this problem. Okay, I, I do want to add very quickly, Dr Nazri, that um... Al Azhar University in Egypt has issued a ban, issued a ban, in fact, on the practice in 2006, um, declaring yeah. it a cultural practice and lacking a foundation in Islam. And um, I think the, the the practice persists because culture and religion often intersect closely um, with Islam. So, but thank you for pointing out that um, you know the the medical practice of it that there are issues and need to be looked at. I do wonder, with your work with Malaysian doctors for women and children, has advocacy in this area um, been difficult 
uh, uh, particularly in Malaysia uh, or with certain segments of Malaysian society where there might be resistance or, or pushback to ideas that there, there are efforts to end this practice? So, of course, um, there is idea about cultural uh, preservation and this whole um, FGM advocacy as a Western agenda. I would like to say that female genital mutilation is practiced in 1800s in uh, the British Victorian era by doctors um, who want to cure hysteria and other ailments which are pseudoscience today. And of course, uh, this practice originated in um, a long time ago. They probably say it's Egypt, but the Romans do it, the Greeks do it, and it's mainly done on slaves to prevent them to becoming more pregnant. So that's why you see the more invasive practices. And uh, historically, uh, this practice came to Southeast Asia, and it is uh, presumed um, between historical experts that we do not want to cut a lot more, otherwise we won't accept Islam. That, that was the historical opinion, and I'm just telling you what the historical experts are saying. Okay, so going forward, um, how do you see the practice being abolished, ending the practice of female genital uh, cutting here in Malaysia? What, what, where are the challenges, where are the barriers, Dr Nazri? Uh, the barriers would be um, culturally, I mean, we see this as a, as a way for the Western world trying to tell us what to do is, is a big issue. Um, but I do feel that with education, re-education and better understanding of the practice, I'm sure uh, parents, uh, healthcare professionals will realise that there's, there's no benefit to this practice and would stop it. I don't feel that criminalisation is the first thing we should do. Mm -hmm. uh, we first need to bring in the safeguarding, safe to ensure that people don't practice it before actually criminalize everyone. Because we have to understand the practice in Malaysia is different. I acknowledge that it is different than the African practice. The African practice, uh, you have type one to type two, which are more invasive and can cause maternal death, bleeding, etc. We don't see that in in our culture, so we have to acknowledge that. Okay, well, in the couple of minutes that we have left, I do want to ask you, you know, for the people watching tonight, what, what's your message to them about not just the gender pain gap, but also ending the practice of female genital cutting? Well, uh, first of all, um, to women, uh, congratulations for living your best life and <laughs> going after your dreams and ambitions. To men and other people, continue to support your women, believe them and cherish them because without women, society will collapse. So happy International Women's Day. Thank you so much, Dr. Hannah Nasri there, uh, wrapping up this episode of The Future is Female. Happy International Women's Day to everyone watching. Thank you so much for your time and I will see you same time next week. Good night.